Good morning, everybody. Do I look taller? Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm standing up. Anyway. This is my Tom Cruise impersonation. <laughs> so thanks for coming uh, to Face to Face. Uh, this, these are the sessions where the real work gets done. And as soon as I start babbling, uh, the serious speakers will get up here and tell you how these little uh, APIs and things uh, work and how you can participate in them. And so um, I'm glad to see we have some, some people from Beijing. Of course, we would like to see more. Tell your friends. Tell your family. Uh, they should come to these things. Because the influence that you can have on the APIs and the influence that the APIs have on the market is almost unmeasurable. The leverage is extraordinary. So, um, for those of you who don't know us, uh, John Bay Research, we do market research. We publish a bi-weekly report called TechWatch. Um, I think you're going to get a USB memory stick with some examples of it in it. <clears throat> and uh, we test things to see if they live up to their uh, promises. And we do a lot of consulting for the uh, investment uh, community and also for all the manufacturers. So the, uh, the, one of the main points that I'd like to uh, get across and, and have you leave here with is that we just don't have time. We have a, a funny saying in our office, a little sign on the wall, that says there are only 25 hours in a day. Use them wisely. <laughs> and that's the kind of life we lead, especially the kind of life we lead uh, in the computer industry, is there just isn't enough time. And part of the reason there isn't enough time is because there's so much competition. Everybody is pushing against everybody else to try to get the market first, to get the latest and greatest design, to beat the competition, to come up with new ideas, etc. And so the time pressure on us is just incredible. Um, proprietary systems are a, a way of taking a shortcut on trying to save some time. But it is also a short sighted uh, approach. And what I mean by that is it's tempting to take a proprietary approach because you can just do what you want to do. You don't have to pay attention to anybody else in the industry. It's your business. You do it. They can just take a hike. But the problem with that is it's just your stuff and you have to support it and you have to have backward compatibility for it. And every time you go to a new version, you rediscover problems you created in the previous version that you didn't have time to fix. So the solution to that is obviously industry standards and industry standards in the form of APIs. Now this problem of proprietary ship is not new to the industry. In fact the industry got started on proprietary because there weren't any standards. But back in the uh, turn of the century, <coughs> excuse me, turn of the century, um, Cronus came together and said, look, the market is really growing. We can see that the growth rate is going to be, and it's going to be total chaos if we don't get some type of management around it. And that management was the establishment of standardized APIs. One of the first ones that uh, we all know and love is OpenGL. And OpenGL was the foundation for the thinking of how an open standards organization could work. Basically, you bring everybody together that has any interest in that API. And it doesn't matter whether it's hardware or software or what platform it's from, whether it's a PC or a workstation or a visualization system, but anybody who, who can get some benefit from that API, bring them all together and let them figure out as a group how to make that the most robust, bulletproof API as you possibly can. And Cronus did this. And... Um, and they went from that to a scaled-down version of OpenGL called OpenGL ES. Now, this is probably a history lesson for most of you in here. You've probably heard all of this. But the main point to remember is that if you don't have an open API and you have proprietary platforms, the software developer is the one who suffers the most. Because when a software developer builds a great app, and it only runs on one phone, let's say. And now they want to get to the next phone. Well, by the time they get there, the next phone has moved on. They're typically a generation behind. So you're always playing catch up to get your great app onto enough platforms. It's, it's difficult, if not impossible. The alternative approach is you have development teams for every phone. 
Well, that can be ridiculously expensive if you think about all the possibilities that are out there. So the easy solution is you have a proprietary platform that is neutralized by an open API. And that's what Cronus comes to do. Well, Cronus didn't do it just once. As Neil mentioned to you, there are 15 APIs out there. And the slide that we built. And that's, that's the list of them. You've seen the list already. But remember this list and remember what Neil said about the 15 uh, APIs because it's an important uh, aspect about Cronus. Today, every OS, no exaggeration, every OS has adopted OpenGL ES. And, and although we're featuring Google on the slide because it's very important, uh, it's not the only one. The chart looks okay. Yeah, you can see the chart. So you can see that everybody is there, and, and, and more are coming, believe it or not. So OpenGL is the industry standard, and it's had a tremendous impact on the market. Now, once again, I forgot to bring the pointer. But what this chart shows is, can you hear me okay? So this shows the adoption of OpenGL ES in mobile phones in 2006. Hello? The percent of adoption of OpenGL in 2006. And as you can see, it was just getting started. And remember, it was only a couple of years old. But the uptake is incredible, to the point where there will be 100% adoption of OpenGL ES on mobile devices uh, by 2014, and in fact, that curve is uh, conservative. I, I think I could argue that we'll hit it in 2013 if we haven't already hit it. Um, just before Neil called me up here, I was actually searching the web to see if I could find anyone who wasn't using OpenGL ES, and the answer was I couldn't. So I think we may have already hit it. Now, in the case of tablets, which came to the market a little bit later, um, it was an instantaneous adoption of OpenGL ES, so it was 100% from day one. Now that's a very, very strong indication of the power of this API and the benefit that it brings. But there's also a subtlety which doesn't quite reveal itself in these charts, and that is that not only was OpenGL ES uh, adopted by everybody, but it actually is responsible for the growth of the market. And the reason that's the case is because, again, back to the software developer, if you now have a wide open environment where you can build an app and it can go on anybody's platform, then your great app is now available to everybody. If your great app is available to everybody, and let's assume that it is a great app, then everybody's going to want it. If everybody wants it, they buy more phones. And so part of the... Um, Mode, mode, uh, was sort of a part of the reason for the uh, explosion of the mobile devices has been the fact of the app stores. The app stores in Google, the app stores in uh, iOS, the app stores in smaller areas. So keep that in mind because that's what an open standard can do for you when it is fully adopted by the industry. So why, why was it fully adopted by the industry? Why is OpenGL ES so great, or why is Cronus so great? <clears throat> and the answer is, it works. Now, the way it works is, or the reason that it works, is that the members of Cronus come together, they meet in rooms just like this, they'll be meeting in this room later today, possibly, I can't remember the schedule, but the point is that they come together and they discuss all of the details of the API, and I mean all of the details, and the representatives of these meetings, companies like yours, come with two goals. Goal number one, make sure that the features that are in their software or their hardware get fully exposed so that they can build great apps and build great processors, and number two, make sure that they don't get locked out of anything that there is no super feature that's in somebody else's processor that comes in and makes it impossible for anyone to uh, overcome it or, or be equal to it. So you come to promote your stuff and you come to protect your stuff. But it's done in an amazing environment of democracy. Everybody gets a vote, everybody gets a voice, 
And at the end of the day, the API is settled with everybody having made their input. Nobody leaves the room feeling they've lost. And that's the beauty of it. So when the API is finally certified, when, when the pro says, this is it, we're done, it's perfect. And it's perfect in every way because in addition to all of these arguments, and there are some pretty good arguments that go on, in addition to all these arguments, the process teases out the corner cases, the gotchas, the things that are going to be bugs after you've shipped it and someone does something in it that you didn't anticipate, and it's a, oh my God, now what do we do? Because of these discussions, and because of the smart people that are in these rooms having these discussions, all those situations, all those considerations, all those cases get exposed. So this API comes out bulletproof. No joke. It comes out amazingly perfect. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there are some bugs. There's always going to be a bug somewhere. But, but the bug list is so damn small, it's unbelievable. And you know how you can measure that? Look at the extensions. Do you see OpenGL 20.1.01.1? No, you don't. Because it's not necessary. Because those bugs weren't there that get a .0101, etc. So it really, really is good in that sense. So they behave well. They're good citizens. They behave well with other things in the system. Do no harm. <laughs> and best of all, free. This is the most amazing part. No licensing fees, no tax, no uh, you have to pay us something every time somebody buys an app that has it and so forth. They are totally, totally free. And another benefit of them being free is by being free, they are totally open to examination. So that again, there can't be any little gotchas in there, no special features for brand X. So that's the beauty of it. This is the most dem democratic system you're ever going to find. The time does not stand still. Remember, the time is never on our side. And the market is expanding. In fact, the market is expanding beyond anybody's imagination. Um, you know, I fancy myself a, a market analyst and a predictor, and I have my crystal ball and I look into the future and so forth. I couldn't call this. Nobody could call this. The way the mobile market is taking off is just incredible. We love it. It's terrific. But at the same time, it creates another problem for us. And that problem is that we need more certified and qualified uh, programmers, people who can program great apps, program test systems, and who understand how these APIs work. And so to meet that need, we're going to create a institute for teaching how to teach APIs. And so one of the missions that uh, Cronus is on for this trip is to introduce to China the KITE program, which is the Cronus, help me out, did it again. <laughs> Institute of Training and Engineering. Institute of Training and Engineering. <laughs> anyway, uh, Eric is going to come up and tell you about it. He's going to do a much better job than I did. But the point is that um, in addition to having great APIs, which Cronus does, we've got to get those APIs in the hands of everybody if we're going to maintain the growth and the, and the uh, uh, distribution of uh, this market. And the only way that's going to happen is if we have very, very smart people teaching very, very smart people how to use these things. So, join Cronus. Tell your friends to join Cronus. Sign up to become a teacher. We can use all the help we can get. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. So I'm Tom Olson. I'm director of graphics research at ARM Media Processing. Um, and I'm also chairman of the OpenGLES Working Group. So I'm presenting today on behalf of the OpenGLES Working Group primarily uh, to talk about what the Working Group has been doing for the past year. And mostly because this is a members meeting and we can talk about confidential information for Cronus Confidential, I will talk about what is going to happen in the next year and possibly the next couple of years. Uh, with OpenGLES. I'm also going to talk some about OpenGL. The OpenGL and OpenGL ES workgroups work very closely together. Um, I told Lichtenbelt at NVIDIA is the chairman of the OpenGL working group. He's not able to be here today, uh, but I've asked him to let me talk a bit about where OpenGL is going as well. So I'll talk first about OpenGL. Uh, 
John and Neil did a fantastic job of explaining the history of, of these groups and how they came to be. OpenGL is 20 years old, uh, first released, first version released uh, in 1992, a frightening thought, uh, before I knew anything about graphics, and now I still don't know anything. Um, went through a long uh, process of development, starting in 2008, uh, realized that OpenGL had become a little bit old-fashioned and was not keeping up with the technology of the latest hardware. And so they said to fix this, uh, well, they had joined Cronus in 2006. Uh, to fix this, they went on to a uh, high productivity cycle of releasing a new version every six months for the next several years. That process completed in uh, August of last year with the release of OpenGL 4.2. With 4.2, OpenGL is, has exactly the same functionality as desktop D3D11. Uh, so it can expose all of the graphics features of the most modern hardware. Uh, what is working now, the working group, is preparing the release of OpenGL 4.3 uh, in 2012. Now that they have caught up with D3D11, they don't see a need to release a new version every six months. So they're going through a longer cycle uh, perhaps once a year or perhaps once every 18 months. But the next version will be OpenGL 4.3, almost certainly at SIGGRAPH this year. So these features, there are many uh, uh, features of these APIs. I'm going to talk about just one, which is the dominant technology trend uh, in OpenGL today. Um, and that is uh, the introduction of GPU computing. So with... Uh, uh, OpenGL 4.2 introduced in August, uh, we added the ability to uh, read and write external memory objects. Traditionally, the graphics pipeline is very self-contained. It can only produce images at the end, and it can't have any other side effects. But with 4.2, we now have the ability to write to texture objects um, and to write to memory buffers, which is uh, a very different capability. We also have the ability to do atomic read, modify, write operations on memory. Um, this is critical because within a GPU, the order in which things happen is not specified. The only thing that is specified is that the pixels come out the back end in order that they were drawn. But internally, the computing can happen anytime. And so it's important to have atomic operations so that you don't have uh, operations uh, have uh, race conditions. Um, so 4.2 gave us atomic counters and shader I.O. 4.3 will give us full compute shaders in the sense of D uh, DX11 uh, and some features which are not in DX11, including the ability to read and write structured memory objects and buffers. It's important to realize this does not replace OpenCL. It's not very good for the kind of demo that Neil showed uh, in which you're doing a physics simulation and rendering the results of the physics simulation. Those are very separate computations, and OpenCL is more flexible, more powerful for that kind of thing. What this is good for is if you want to do very tightly interleaved, small amounts of computing and graphics very tightly coupled, which is difficult to do with OpenCL because it's a different API. It works at a different level. I have an example of this, which I'll talk about if we have time, but perhaps I will uh, cut it and you can ask me about it later. Other priorities of the working group, we're working ever more closely between desktop GL and OpenGL ES as the technology becomes more similar, as mobile devices become almost as capable as desktop devices. It's necessary for us to work together. So we're making some organizational changes to improve that. Uh, improvements to support WebGL uh, to clean up the specification and to improve compliance. That's what's happening with OpenGL today. I'm going to talk now about OpenGL and ES. Uh, John and Neil gave a fantastic overview of where OpenGL ES is, its place in the market. Um, we're, of course, uh, terribly excited about it, and we're particularly excited this year when I say OpenGL ES2 is a success. The thing that is striking in the past year is that we have seen the circuit complete between uh, uh, silicon providers at one end, uh, leading all the way up to very high-end applications development. So in this past year, we have 
uh, premium game engines like Unreal Engine 3, Unity, running on OpenGL ES2. And we have uh, game studios producing great high-end expensive games like uh, uh, this is Rage, this is uh, Infinity Blade. Um, these are premium games that cost more money than standard traditional games, but people pay for them because they are great stuff. They are more fun. They look better. Uh, and so this circuit is now closed, and we have the consumer getting what they want, and the chain is unbroken all the way to the silicon and IP provider. That is what we have wanted for the past 10 years, and this year it's finally happening. So that's extremely exciting. Um, what the working group is working on now, what we will be doing in Dublin in a month, uh, we're working on the final release of OpenGL ES 3.0. Um, we're doing some new technology development, particularly in texture compression, and we are working very hard on what comes after OpenGLES 3.0. So I'll talk about each one of those. OpenGLES 3.0, we've been working on this for a very long time, uh, longer than we wanted to. It took five years to get where we are. Uh, where it is today, the specification is finished, the promoters have it, and it's in a process of IP review in order to make sure that the uh, the Kronos promise of royalty-free is kept. Um, there are some issues that need to be looked at hard, so that is uh, under ongoing right now. Um, in addition to having a specification, we don't feel comfortable releasing a new API unless we also have conformance tests, so we're working actively on that. Uh, Qualcomm, in particular, has volunteered one of its staff to be uh, uh, the lead for the conformance test, and that work is progressing. Manual pages are being written. The lead for that are from Imagination Technologies and Qualcomm. And the submission process and general management is being done by, by me. Uh, in order to release, we still expect to need to have two implementations ready to go at the day of release. We think that will happen. Nobody wants to tell anybody their secret plans, so it's not 100% clear, but I believe it. Uh, the result is we should be ready to release at SIGGRAPH 2012. Uh, I have very high confidence in that date. Texture compression. Uh, this is a topic very dear to my heart because it has been consumed a lot of my life in the past year. Um, in mobile devices, compression is a good thing. Power is important, memory bandwidth is important. They're important on the desktop too, but most important in mobile. And it was pointed out over a year ago that there was a shortage in the technology in the area of low bitrate texture compression. The only standard available was PDRTC, which is proprietary, so it could not be incorporated in front of standards. And it's also a little bit dated and the quality is not what it might be. Um, at the beginning of last year, uh, around GDC, uh, actually a little before, NVIDIA proposed uh, some technology that they had developed, the Zill 3. Uh, ARM came back and proposed something that we had developed called ASPC. And for the past year, we've had a very exciting, friendly competition uh, between these teams to see who could convince the working group and produce the best technology. It was really interesting to see Kronos at its finest because each group challenged the other with improving quality. So NVIDIA would improve theirs, ARM would improve theirs, NVIDIA would improve theirs, ARM would improve theirs. And the quality of both proposals grew and grew over the year until we saw a convergence at the end of the year. Uh, we also uh, made special efforts to talk to the best game developers in the world, Epic, Dice, etc., um, and get their feedback on these standards. Uh, at the end of the year, we selected ASTC as the direction we were going to go. And now we're all working together on this. So it's no longer ARM's proposal. It's Kronos technology. And uh, uh, we're all working together to finish the specification and make it ready for release. Um, particularly interesting features of this, it is the most flexible compressed texture format the world has ever seen by a wide margin. It supports a very wide, large number of bit rates from less than one bit per pixel up to eight in fine steps. At any bit rate, you can have up to four color components. Uh, you can have both low dynamic range, which is 8-bit uh, uh, per component, or you can have high dynamic range, which is floating point for every pixel. 
You can even have both in the same image. Um, and you can have both 2D and 3D. So where we are today, we have fully specified the 2D low dynamic range modes, and we're writing the specification for that. At least one member wants to produce that in silicon by itself. So we will release a special spec which includes only that. Uh, high dynamic range of 3D modes are almost complete. ARM believes they're complete. We're about to submit them to the working group for evaluation. We're writing a, the final specification, which is the one which will be ratified. Previously, we had only a hardware spec. And we plan to release it SIGGRAPH 2012 if possible. I believe it's possible. Might be possible before for the low dynamic range. Um, just to give an example of the capability that this technology has. Um, I won't go through this table in detail, but this compares ASTC at different bit rates to other leading commercial formats at the same bit rates. PVRTC is the proprietary standard. DXT1 is the traditional standard from, uh, from uh, old-fashioned uh, direct 3D. ETC2 is the standard that is in OpenGLES 3.0. BC7 is from DirectX 11. Um, I will ask you just to look at one number because it's the most interesting. The second line down, two bits per pixel, ASTC versus PVRTC at the same bit rate. ASTC improves by three decibels. Now, if you're not a signal processing person, this may not impress you, but three decibels is, well, for reference, most humans looking at an image can see a difference of three-tenths of a decibel with no problem. So a three-decibel margin is very, very visible. And I have an example. So this is uh, an original, it's a detail from an original image which I took on vacation in France last year. It's a food stall. Um, if you compress this image with uh, PBRTC at two bits per pixel, I don't know how visible this is to you in the back of the room, but I would ask you to observe some... Uh, Blotting artifacts, lots of uh, detail, also dark spots here and here. So there are a lot of artifacts. Um, if you compress the same image with ASTC, I wish we didn't have that transition effect. It would be easier to see the difference. Uh, but I hope that the quality difference is visible. Let me see if I can. Oh, you need a transition. Okay, so this is PBRTC. I have many more examples if people want to see them. This computer is practically full of them. So that's the new technology development. Um, the last topic which I'll talk about is the next generation spec. Uh, we began talking about this at our last face-to-face -face meeting in, uh, in Colorado. And we're hoping to have broad agreement at the Dublin meeting on the shape of what we're going to do next. We have a code name. It is called Raylock. All uh, uh, OpenGLES standards are named after very small mountains because it's a mobile API. Uh, so the stage that we're in now is a very interesting one for new members to participate because right now there is no history for Greylock. We have made no decisions for it. So if people have input, this is the best time to give that input. Um, we're collecting information about requirements analysis. John said the standards are always perfect at release. I wish that were true. Uh, there are things that we think we will learn about ES3, particularly when developers have more access to it. We will find out that there are things that we didn't do as well as we could. So we need to know what those are. Also, the market will change. The requirements will change. So we're collecting information about that. Um, we do have general agreement that is in our last face-to-face. -face, it was clear that uh, most of us feel that cleanup is needed. OpenGL ES3 is backward compatible with ES2, which has value for developers, but it also constrains the API. It's not as clean as it could be. So we want to do some cleanup. It happens that desktop OpenGL is also doing some cleanup, and we want the two APIs to move together into the future. Uh, so there we'll introduce a new object model, and in the case of ES, we'll get rid of the old object model uh, to be more object-oriented, better for programmers, uh, better for middleware. Uh, the other thing we'll do is that we will include this integrated, tightly coupled computing 
that I talked about that the desktop is doing today, we will do that in the next generation class. As I said, this is the best time for members who want to shape the future of OpenGLES to provide their input. So we're very eager to hear uh, what people have to say. Thank you very much. Very nice to meet you. My name is Juan Yong Lee. I'm from Korea. So my company uh, is developing visual you know, SC graphics card and uh, software drivers. So I will shortly introduce OpenGL SC. So my company is developing OpenVG and OpenGL SC related product. And we are testing the, our uh, OpenGL SC graphics card. This graphics card will be used for airplanes, so we should test on very various kind of uh, temperature, minus 45 degree and 90, 95 five degrees. So, and actually, we passed the OpenGL SC performance test. Currently, this is only one OpenGL SC component product. Uh, OpenGL SC is uh, a partial partial profile of OpenGL ES 1.1 and we deduced that uh, some very complex feature is not fit for the safety crit critical application. Um, so mainly the main OpenGL SC purpose is targeted to avionics business and the avionics industry and defense industry. So it, it assumed that it, it will have some kind of a quality assurance process. Its name is DO one seventy A A B C process. It is very uh, very harsh. The quality assurance test. So uh, to test it, uh, to pass that uh, quality assurance test, we should reduce the set of uh, size of uh, uh, graphics drivers and software size. So. We reduce that. We we reduce that complex features and changing languages, and we, uh, it is only for uh, very critical issues. Currently, OpenGL SC version is SC OpenGL SC version one point zero point one actually, and the, it is work. It is the worked by the Shivit, Baco, Ethisoft, and you know, and Asmodee. 3D lab in quantum 3D, and it is the the main purpose of OpenGL SC is application is not drawing the 3D the 3D terrain or 3D building or something. The open purpose of OpenGL SC is drawing uh, gauge cluster like uh, the oh, this the too much that drawing gauge cluster, not drawing the 3D map or something. I mean, it is for, actually it is for drawing, uh, the, the main purpose is changing this, the, the mechanical the gauges into the electronic, uh, electronic gauge clusters. And then the OpenGL SEC is targeted to drawing this, the gauge and some kind of a they're displaying some status of a machine or fuel gauge or something. So it is the quality of a uh, drawing gauge or drawing text is very important in OpenGL SC application. I already said that the OpenGL SC 1.0 is the partial set of OpenGL ES, and and we add some kind of future features like um, uh, the begin and the paradigms and and the text uh, palette textures and show, showing the texture palette and and some kind of dash line or pattern filling feature is added to official yes I was we don't have enough time so I skip some some technical issues. Uh, we don't have, a, in OpenGL SC, they don't have a local light and they don't have two side lighting and multi sampling is not supported and surely probe is not supported in OpenGL SC. Uh, 
and there is dash dry and pattern filling and the texture sharing features. Okay. Um, actually, I listed all features of OpenGL SCC in, in presentation so you can download it in front of page. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll go to conclusion. Currently, there is some kind of technical issue in, in current OpenGL SCC standard because since two 2004, there is no graphics chip is supporting the palleted color texture. So, to implement palleted texture, we should implement with the shading language or software. So, it is technically, it makes, it makes so much annoying things because we should pass some kind of quality assurance problem, but we should use shading language drivers and so many things. So it, it makes big trouble in quality assurance. So we should change these features, the begin and the features and the palette texture or something. And I, I hope that we should make new the safety critical standard based on OpenGL ES 2.0. Uh, and we, we, we are developing OpenGL SEC product based on the OpenGL ES 1.0, 1.1, and 2.0, but uh, we should modify, we should modify some the, 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 some requirement in OpenGL SSC 1.12, so, because it is very hard to implement on OpenGL ES 2.0 chip, and okay, there, there is some kind of technical issues, oh, yeah, easily, the, in current, the defense industry and awareness industry also request that the 3D drawing, 3D building drawing, 3D terrain drawing is required. But the 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 chips the produced before two, 2004, it, it does not have enough performance. So we uh, in in awareness business in in defense industry they, they request the high performance graphic, graphic chips, but we cannot support with current new developed chips, so I think we should surely we need to do some cool next version of OpenGL SC. That's my conclusion. Okay. Thank you.